Welcome to the Mineral Sciences Lab. I wanted to give you a tour of some of the instruments that we use to measure how atoms are bound to each other and how atoms are stacked and arranged in space. So over here on the left is our Raman spectrometer. And what this is, is that we essentially fire a laser at our samples, in this case minerals, and light hits that mineral and then some of the energy is passed to the crystal itself and re-released at different wavelengths of light. And that characteristic change in the frequency of light is very diagnostic to how the minerals are arranged in space. And so we can use this tool to measure distortions, we can measure geometries of atoms uh, very, very precisely. So with the Raman spectrometer, we were able to measure distortions of atoms and also bonding angles and, and essentially how molecules are shaped in space with this X-ray microscope, we can measure uh, what elements are there to begin with. And so with this tool, we use X-rays and we fill up these wells with our sample and then we just program the computer to go from one well to the next well to the next well. It collects X-ray spectra and from that spectra, we get elemental specific information that tells us which elements are present. These two techniques, Raman spectroscopy tells us how they're, how they're bonded to each other. X-ray spectroscopy tells us what elements there, what are our building blocks to begin with. So these two instruments that are on my left and on my right are called X-ray diffractometers. And so instead of using X-ray spectroscopy, what we're doing is we're using X-ray diffraction. How that is different than spectroscopy? Well, spectroscopy tells us what elements are present in the material, where diffraction tells us how the atoms are arranged in space. So essentially the architecture of how the stack of atoms uh, generate the crystal structure. So the instrument on the left is one type of diffractometer where we can load many, many samples on there and have that data automatically collected over time. And then when we come back, we have a lot of data that we can analyze very quickly. We can do lots of different things with this particular instrument. For example, the things that are loaded on right now are materials from the alpine glaciers in the Peruvian Andes where we're looking for how minerals are contributing to the rapid glacial retreat in those alpine glaciers there. And so we're doing a lot of environmental mineralogy here. This instrument on the right is where we look at just single crystals of materials. And this instrument allows us to generate how crystals are built in three dimensions. And that's the wall back here that you see with all the new minerals that have been discovered in this laboratory. And to discover a mineral, you have to characterize how atoms are built in space, how they're stacked, and what gives them their unique geometries. The single crystal diffractometer is what we use to measure how atoms are arranged in space for the entire length of the crystal. And what it does is it essentially allows us to take images of slices through different parts of the crystal. And from that, we reconstruct how the atoms are arranged in space. And once we figure out how the atoms are arranged in space, then we can print up the entire crystal structure. And so you see crystal structures above here, um, which can be three-dimensionally printed. And we feed the computer, the printer, the information that we obtain from the diffraction analysis to generate those molecular building blocks. We are in our high security room here in Mineral Sciences and we have several vaults and this is where we keep some of more of our precious items. And some of the things that are in this particular vault are some rare examples. This little guy right here, this little gem, is a gem called Chatuite. This is the world's rarest gem. There's no other mineral of this material in existence anywhere outside these walls. It was found in Burma by a gemologist who mistakenly thought it was something else and eventually came here to the Natural History Museum for description and eventual publication. It was donated by that gemologist to the Natural History Museum because he thought it would be a great place for it to be on display. Uh, we have examples of gold, rare golds. So this is a single crystal of gold. You can see um, the scaffolding of the crystal edges along the sides. So speaking of scaffolding, we often use that technique in designing of materials for engineered crystal applications for environmental or for pharmaceutical use. What scaffolding allows us to do is that we can take different parts of the crystal structure from different minerals and split them apart and then arrange them, arrange the layers like scaffolds with other binding units that eventually give the material new function and new properties that we can use for all kinds of applications. We take uh, naturally occurring processes and sort of figure out how engineered materials are interacting with those naturally occurring processes. So one example is concrete weathering. Concrete as it interacts with soil 
will tend to decompose and form minerals called mirabilite. Mirabilite will then grow within the cracks of the concrete, dehydrate and expand into the mineral thenardite, and that would cause a lot of concrete destruction. But we're trying to use minerals to combat those effects to try and stop the formation of mirabilite and thenardite in the concrete works. So we can do that by this architectural design of materials, we can modify materials and specifically tailor them to applications of soil remediation and concrete preservation. And here in this lab, we try to better understand that, how those materials interact with their natural environment.